Yeah, welcome to our lecture series and a special warm welcome to our guest, Professor Ingrid Madsen. Uh, as you know, patience is a central virtue in Islam and we waited really patiently to have Professor Ingrid Madsen here with us. We met her in uh, 2013 in Berlin and uh, later invited her to our lecture series and the last semester it didn't work out, but this semester it does and we are really grateful to have her here and also that you take, uh, took the long trip from Canada and all the struggle with jet lag and things like this. So we, we benefited already uh, uh, from your knowledge, experience and insights yesterday and all students who have been uh, in the program since yesterday can testify to this, I think. Um, Professor Ingrid Madsen holds the London and Windsor Community Chair in Islamic Studies at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. And before that she was uh, as well Professor for Islamic Studies at Hartford Seminary in Connecticut. And besides her academic work, she's an, active, uh, an activist in the Muslim community and in society uh, with a number of functions, <coughs> most prominently first as Vice President of the Islamic Society of North America uh, for nine years in the post 9-11 era, starting with 2001, uh, which may be a difficult task. And after this, pres uh, she served as president uh, for several years. Her main areas of interest are the Quran, ethical questions and interreligious dialogue. And we get from all of this uh, something in this week. Uh, tomorrow there's another uh, lecture with Professor Metzen um, on interreligious dialogue organized from the uh, Muslim Students Association or MHG. <laughs> uh, and she has of course many publications uh, of which I want only to highlight her book. It's called The Story of the Quran, Its History and Place in Muslim Life. It appeared already in a second edition and was translated into several languages. Uh, she also received numerous awards as well as honorary doctorates. Uh, for example, she's a senior fellow of the Royal Al Bayt Institute for Islamic Thought in Amman, and she was named as one of the most, uh, the 500 most influential Muslims for uh, four years uh, in in series. <laughs> and today, her topic is, um, and the believers, men and women, are protecting protecting friends one of another. Uh, a verse of the Quran, joint engagement for the sake of community. So we are curious for your insights and experience <coughs> to share with us. Go ahead. Right. Can I put this down here? Yeah, you somewhere? I think you should put it over your head. Maybe, I don't know. If it's you can sound. How does this sound? Or how does it sound here? Good. Can you hear? All right. Well, good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm so happy to be joining you here in this beautiful city. Uh, I am, in addition to uh, spending the week here teaching, I am raiding all of the coffee shops in Osnabrück and have a good list so far. I'll tell you at the end of the week which makes the best cappuccino, in my view, of course. This is an area of ikhtilaf, difference of opinion. Uh, I begin in the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to God, the Lord of the worlds. Wassalatu wassalam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. And may God's peace and blessings be upon our master, Muhammad. Uh, I, I want to begin by apologizing for lecturing you in English. I know this is a hegemonic uh, language globally. And everywhere I go, I just assume people will understand English. Uh, so this is part of our linguistic privilege of the English speakers and our global domination. I apologize for that. I recognize as I begin this lecture where I'm going to be talking about women in the community and sometimes the disempowerment of women in the community that there are many kinds of imbalances in power in the world. It, it is not only that there can be imbalances between men and women. There can be imbalances in power between different classes in society. Uh, those manual laborers, professionals, between those who are citizens or who are uh, uh, official nationals and those who are not given citizenship or residency. 
Um, there are uh, dis, uh, uh, power displacements between people who have access to education and those who don't. So I think one thing that's important to understand is that when we look at, at any particular um, imbalance in a relationship and try to rectify it, is that it is not the only lens we should look through. We are human beings and we should always try to look at the totality of our humanity. I do not look at myself in any way as a, as a victim or as an oppressed person. Although in some circumstances, I experience discrimination as a Muslim. In some circumstances, I experience discrimination um, as a woman. On the other hand, I am part of the privileged class because of my citizenship, because of my access to education, because uh, I'm white, uh, which makes a big difference uh, in this world today. So um, I want us to, to continually think about this and think about this as one aspect of our humanity that we need to look at. This was something important to me when, from the beginning when I did my doctoral thesis, which was on slavery and social status in early Islamic society and law. And there I looked at, even among women, the different statuses among women. So for example, many elite women would try to empower themselves and have access to more freedom and autonomy, historically as now, by disempowering other women. So their freedom was often bought at the expense of other women. Um, for example, they might be able to study and pursue business uh, because they employ a woman to do other work uh, for her in her household, taking care of the kids, shopping. There's nothing wrong with a division of labor if it's just. But to employ another woman at less than a living wage, to overwork her, to uh, take her passport away so she can't be free to visit her family, all of these things is the participation of women in structural injustice as well. So this is why I have no problem with using the term feminism if we say sometimes we have to take a feminist angle to look at the issue of women's autonomy and equality. But we should never make any one of these um, lenses the totality of our identity. Because I can take refuge in that and then ignore my positionality in society where I, in fact, as a white person, as a Western person, as a national, am participating in systems of injustice and oppression against other people. So I'm not just this one thing. And today, what I talk about today is not the only situation that I care about. I care about also about the many, many disempowered men who are suffering as the result of my privileged lifestyle. So we all need to, to acknowledge that. And this is part of ethical teaching and formation. We should take our own experience and any experience we have with marginalization and disempowerment and use it to help us develop principles and empathy so we could help others. This is true as Muslims too. Wherever we experience disempowerment, we, it should not result in us saying, okay, all we care about is the disempowerment of Muslims and we ignore the disempowerment of every other people in society. If we do that, it simply becomes a case of religious tribalism. It is another form of asabiya, where our, being a Muslim, it's like joining a gang or being part of a tribe. It's, it's our team that we're rooting for. This is not what Islam means. Islam means about developing our, our, our self and our spirit, our moral formation, character formation, for the sake of becoming close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that means critically examining ourselves, critically examining our community, and trying to reflect that rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is the dominant attribute, the, the attribute that we want to see reflected in creation to reflect that for everyone. This is not, uh, uh, rahmah like love is not a limited quantity in the universe. If we give mercy to people in our community, it doesn't mean we We've, we've used up a store of mercy. Allah's mercy is, is uh, infinite, and we should reflect that, that to others. 
I want to begin with this talk about women and men in the community with, um, with a comparative analysis of the story of the matriarch of our religion, one of the founders of our religion, Hajar, alayhi salam, may peace be upon her, who was a, a great figure in Islamic history, who was a founder of both um, sacred space and religious practices that we have until today, who according to, depending on what your categorization of prophecy is, could be considered a prophet in the sense that she, is, she had um, uh, an angel sent to her, she had uh, established a, uh, a form of ibadah that we um, until today repeat. This is semantics. If you say women can't be prophets, then, then that's, it, it doesn't really matter to me. This is to some extent a semantical issue. The major issue is to, to understand that she is a spiritual matriarch. And it's important for us to understand where these women are in our tradition so we have a clear picture of what Islam says about the role of men and women. And to do that, let's have a comparison. Here we have a passage from Genesis in the Bible, um, in the Hebrew Bible. Um, and it's translated here, and it talks about the place when uh, uh, Ibrahim, Abraham, may God's peace be upon him, um, took or sent her and her son away. So let's let's look. Who has good English? Very good. You do? No. no. no? Oh, oh, come on. Come on. Okay, someone. Come over. Come on. Jump over. One of you women over here. Jump over the side. Jump over. Jump over the desk. Okay, Amina. Come on. Come on. Get out. And try to get in here. Come up beside me. And then I want one more volunteer. Is there a man? A man who can speak good English who would like to volunteer? Just stand beside me. Wait for your turn. Anyone, or I will pick you. Okay, come over here. I would like you to read this for us. <coughs> Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hajar. He set them on, on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered uh, in the desert of Beersheba? Mm -hmm. Beersheba. Beersheba. When the water and the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down, about a bowshot away. For the thought, I cannot wa watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of, of God called to Hajar from heaven and said to her, what, are the, what is the matter, Hajar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take Take he him take him him mm -hmm. by the hand for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a, dr a drink. Thank you. Okay, next. Can you do this? Yeah. Okay. Can you do this? Yes. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Yes. Thank you. Zekalokhe. Come on, you can. I, be, I know you can read because I saw you in a in a university. So, I am pretty pretty clear. Can you read this in a loud voice? Okay. Abraham brought her and her son Ismail while she was suckling him to a place near the Kaaba under a tree under a tree on the spot of Zemzem, at the highest place in the mosque. During those uh, during those days, there was nobody in Mecca, nor was there any water. So he made them sit over there and placed near, uh, placed near them <coughs> a leather bag containing some dates and a small skin containing some water uh, and set out homeward. Ismail, uh, uh, Ismail's mo mother followed him saying, O oh Abraham, where are you going? Leaving us in this valley the where there is no person uh, whose company we may enjoy, nor is there anything here she repeated that to him many times, but he did not look back at her. Then she asked him, has God ordered you to do so? He said, yes. She said, then he will not uh, neglect us. Neglect us. Neglect us. Uh, and returned while Abraham pr proceeded uh, onwards and on reaching the Thania, where they could not see him, he faced the Kaaba and raising b both hands invoked God saying the following prayers, O our Lord, I have made 
Some of my offspring dwell in a valley without cultivation by your sacred house in an order, O our Lord, that they may offer prayer perfectly. perfectly. So, fill, uh, so fill the hearts of people with love towards them and provide them with fruits so that may give thanks. Okay, so this is the first part of uh, a hadith where the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa tells the story of Hajar. And it continues. Ismail's mother went on suckling Ismail and drinking from the water she had. When the water in the water skin had all been used up, she became thirsty and her child also became thirsty. She watched him tossing in agony and left him for she could not endure looking at him and found that the mountain of Safa was the nearest mountain uh, to her on that land. She stood on it and started looking at the valley keenly so that she might see somebody, but she could not see anybody. Then she descended from Safa, and when she reached the valley, she tucked up her robe and ran in the valley like a person making a great effort, can majhud, until she crossed the valley and reached the Marwa mountain where she, where she stood and kept looking, expecting to see somebody, but she could not see anybody. She repeated that, running between Safa and Marwa seven times. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, this is the source of the tradition of the running of the people between the mountains of Safa and Marwa. And you know the rest of the story. Then the angel Gabriel um, was sent to open up the well of Zamzam, which became a source of water uh, um, for them and for all people. The story continues that because there was now water, a passing caravan saw from a distance, saw birds circling, and they knew that those birds only, only would be present where there was water. They knew there was no water before, so they're curious. They went over there, and they see, there she is, Hajar alayhi salam, and her son Ismail, there beside the water. They say, this is wonderful. Can we settle with you? Can we live with you? She says, yes, but I control the water. And they settle with her, and her son marries into that, that group, and they found these are the people, the, de, the descendants of the, their descendants are the Arab people of the Quraysh. <coughs> so we have two versions of the story, of the same story. Can anyone tell me what are some significant differences that you see in the stories? In terms of uh, the relationships that are being expressed here and the responses to the situation. Yes. 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 Okay, you can say it in German and someone will tell me what you mean. Okay. I think Hajar did something. She tried to do something to save her child and to, yeah, to. Right. This is one of the, really, what I see as a very key difference in the two stories is that Hajar has a very active role in the uh, report that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is narrating. In the biblical story, Hajar is left by Abraham. She's sent out, go, and she goes, right? And then she's there, she runs out of the water. What, do, what does she do? She sits down and cries. She's crying, and then God intervenes, the water appears, and he, he even has to say, say, okay, open your eyes now so you could see. So she's there. In this beautiful story narrated by the Prophet Muhammad Sassam, there's such a big difference. First of all, when she, she goes, Sayyidina Ibrahim takes her there, and when he goes to leave her there, what does she do? She questions him. She says, is this from you or is this from God? Right? She said, oh, Abraham, where are you going leaving us in this valley? She repeats it, keeps asking him, and then she says, has God ordered you to do so? And when he says yes, what does she say? Then he will not neglect us. So here we see 
the, and this, this is so interesting, because this is also how the Sahaba, men and women used to be with the Prophet Muhammad that they would ask him, O Messenger of Allah, is this from you? Is this wahi? Or is this from you? Yani your opinion, right? Which is a very important theological lesson in Islam, that no human being has authority in and of among themselves. That any human being who's, who's making some uh, judgment about something to do can be questioned, can be interrogated. Even here, Hajar, her husband's a prophet. You know, this is the, t the period of patriarchs, the patriarchs of Banu Israel, of the, this is before Banu Israel, but the patriarchs of the Hebrew people. And here she is questioning him, hey, you know, she's not just like, oh, well, whatever happens, I'll just go. She doesn't say a word in the biblical story. Here she's taught, he's speaking. She is speaking. She's an active questioning role. And when, when he Sam says, this is from God, she then says, he will not neglect this. This is a positive act of faith. And we see this is also reflected later in the story when God orders Abraham السلام, to sacrifice his son. His son engages with him in the conversation and then says, then I will be among those who submit. It's not, the son is not a passive voiceless, voiceless victim. But it is the family together believing in God, and each one has to have the conviction. No one is used as an instrument by the others. So Hajar is not used as an instrument by her husband. The son is not used as an instrument by the father. They are active in themselves. They decide to participate in this act of faith. So this is a beautiful part of it. And so she... she is there. Now she's decided she knows God will survive, will, will help them survive, will not neglect them, but she doesn't know how. She doesn't ha can't see in Mulghayb, she can't see the future. All she knows is she has faith, but she doesn't know the way out. The reason why she would run, she's running back and forth to the tops of the mountains, is she thinks that her salvation is going to come from other people, that someone's going to appear, so she goes to the highest place so she could look. You know, maybe someone's coming from this side. No, maybe someone's coming from this side because our human imagination is very limited. So we only think of certain things. When we're in a very difficult situation, we think, oh, maybe, uh, maybe this will happen. We're praying for this way out of it. But then sometimes God opens another way. We never thought of this other way. So this is a beautiful story of faith that we, that we have in this, this lesson about hardship and the openings that God gives us. That, that we have to have that faith, but we don't necessarily know where this is going to come. So she's running back, and, and so she is not passive. She has tawakkul, she has faith, she has iman, but she's doing something about it. She's doing what she can. And through that effort, faith and effort, right, iman and amr, together, then there is an intervention. And the intervention is this water that opens up that creates now life, not only for her, not only for her son, but for the birds that begin to circle around and come and drink, for people who come and settle there. So through her faith, she has, she has brought life to creatures and people who never were able to live there before. She makes it a beneficial place in a material sense but then also makes it possible for this to be a place where people come and worship constantly. It is later when Sayyidina Ibrahim comes back, when Ismail grows up, that together they build the Kaaba um, as a permanent place, a permanent place of worship that until now continues. And this is why part of our mandatory hajj is following in her footsteps. We follow in remembrance of her action, her faith. So this is what's very moving about this action, and I hope if you, you know, go on Hajj, you go on Umrah, you do this, really uh, understand the, the implications of this. So this is what, what, you know, this is a foundational story for Muslims. 
And in this foundational story, we see a woman who is in difficult circumstances, but is, is playing an active role, is working with her family to establish this whole new line, the, this, another line of the descendants of Abraham, who's working to, through her effort, has established this place, Mecca, as a place for life and a place, sacred place for worship. Um, and this is really important to remember because there are other versions of the story. And whoever told the story that eventually ended up in the Bible had a certain view of, uh, of which branch of Abraham was the chosen one and was really kind of, didn't really care about the, the Ismailites, the people who descended from Ism Ismail. So they <coughs> are not given you know, it said, well, they will be a great people. You have this line, but there's not a lot of interest in telling that, that part of the line. So we don't, we see her role as, you know, she's this voiceless, passive kind of person. It's very easy in, when, it's very easy for a story to get distorted. It's very easy for what is uh, uh, an incident as it goes through, you know, different, narrations, different oral transmission, that if there's not very careful scrutiny and attention and concern for the details, it gets filtered through the eyes and the perception and the interests and the desires of the people who are telling the story. They select a little bit of it and they neglect the rest. This is a human reality and it's a reality Muslims face with our own tradition. There are many empowering stories from the Islamic tradition. There are many empowering role models, but how often are they told? I can't tell you how, um, how really sobering it is for me as a professor when I, when I teach and I ask, you know, I'll ask my first year students, have you heard, what do you know about the founding of Mecca? Tell me about it. Tell me, what do you know about name as many female companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu as you can. They can't even name all the Umm al-Hatim mu'minin, much less the other women. Name a famous woman scholar in Islamic history. Nothing. And these are the students who are religious students who are coming to study Islamic studies. Um, the ignorance in our community about, about women's role historically in Islam is so horrible, it's almost... <laughs> I'm going to use this word, it's almost a conspiracy of silence. I mean, you start to say, why is this happening again and again? Not a conspiracy theorist, but it is very problematic. So um, this is just a, a, a painting of, from the Western version of Hajar being sent out. So this is the view of her, right? In the Western tradition, this is our view of her, right? <laughs> SubhanAllah. And this is, of course, you know, the, the one of the, um, of course, the, the representative, the representative visual tradition of Western civilization or of European civilization is very beautiful and moving and, it's, and should be appreciated for its own right. But what's interesting about the Islamic tradition is we don't lack because we don't have this representative tradition. Because we have our stories that are told, that are narrated, and also that are embodied in our actions. You see, the, the, the image is as we run, we are recreating. It's like a, and maybe now these days that we have um, people playing virtual games where you embody an avatar or something. In a way, we, Islam is almost uh, fits better in this kind of age where you have this virtual representation, because in a way, this recreation is a kind of virtual representation of her actions, but embodied in ourself. Might sound a little bit um, kind of uh, fantastic, but think about it for a little while. Um, what is it when we talk about patriarchy? What's the word in German? <laughs> same word, same word. Yes, pretty much. So, so I can understand half of what people are, it's pretty almost the same language. Okay, so patriarchy literally means the rule of, of elder men, 
So the authority or empowerment of elder men. So it's not only the rule of uh, uh, the authority of men over women, it's also involved the rule of elders over younger. So in a patriarchal society, you will see, for example, in a typical, you know, many typical, um, like a traditional Arab mm -hmm. society, who is the person who all the brothers and sisters have to listen to? The oldest brother, right? Um, you know, if you, have, if you have four brothers and they're separated by nine months each, it doesn't matter. The three th that are younger have to listen to the older one. I have uh, friends who are from Libya and they have twin, twin boys. And one of the boys was born two minutes before the other. And he actually says, my brother has to listen to me because I'm older. Uh, so this is, this is part of, of patriarchy. The word sheikh, literally, the literal meaning of sheikh is old man, elder man, an old man, or sometimes we use the term elder when we want to talk respectfully about people. So sheikh means old man. And this is why um, it has, the, it has the, the, literally, and it was used to indicate the Sheikh al-Qabila, who is the, the elder man in the tribe, but it also has the, the connotation of wisdom. That's why sometimes we'll call even younger people in a religious context, we'll call them Sheikh, or how this term got transferred over to Sheikh, because it's elder. It's like the person we respect for their knowledge and wisdom. Um, patriarchy is this, so patriarchy in and of itself is this, is the view that in and of themselves, men have authority status or over women, irregardless of their merits, right? Regardless of their merits. You may have a very brilliant woman, um, and you might have a uneducated, um, uh, not very wise man, Yet, just because of his maleness, because of his gender, he has this uh, uh, power that the woman doesn't have. So when, when we talk about patriarchy in the community, this is part of what we're looking at. Now the question is, to what extent is um, patriarchy necessarily part of Islam? To what extent is it a good thing in Islam? Some people argue that it's a stabilizing force in society and that it's a necessary part of Islam. Some people argue very strongly against it. Um, of these two books, and this is, this is a, um, a Amin Wadud, who's known for some very original, progressive interpretations in Islam, non-traditional, non-orthodox positions, um, nevertheless makes some interesting arguments. But I would say that this um, Asma Barlis uh, makes much more convincing arguments to me in part of her book. Part of her book is, in my view, wrong historically and theologically. But there's something that she says that's really interesting to me and I think very compelling. She says that part of the Islamic message is, in fact, explicitly anti-patriarchal. And proof of it is in that, that with the prophethood of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that this ends the reign of the patriarchal prophets. Because the prophets of, of um, Bani Israel and also the prophet, the Arab prophets were all prophets who were at the same time patriarchs of their people, meaning that um, rule was passed through Bani Israel from father to son or father to another male in, in line, right? So there was a, there was a passing down through the male line of religious authority. Um, now, what's interesting is that, um, uh, what does the Quran say about Muhammad uh, when it comes to his maleness? Uh, what's very interesting is the place where the Prophet Muhammad's maleness is explicitly addressed is to refute the relevance of it. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, Muhammad is not the father of any of your men. Um, he is not the father of any of your men, but he is 
he is? What is he? Right. So he's the seal of the prophets, the seal, the end of that. So with the prophet Muhammad Sallam, he ends the patriarchal rule of prophet of prophecy. He is not the father of any of your men. So there's a real kind of denial of the relevance of his masculinity to a large extent. That the major feature of of masculinity and of course Allah is capable of doing all things could easily have given him many sons but any sons he had Allah took their life when they were very young so he was the father of girls he was the father of women right and um, this is very interesting because uh, nothing that happens in the life of the Prophet Muhammad is accidental. I mean, Allah chose his life from the beginning of who his parents were, to who raised him, to being, to being orphaned, to, you know, all through it, his life, everything was significant. So this, we have to give it some significance and, and really think about this. We also have to look into the fact that um, people before us, the people who were recipients of revelation, were permitted to call Allah Father. So this is why we have the prayer of Jesus, peace be upon him, our Father who art in heaven, right? So it was typical in Christianity and Judaism to call God our Father. It is forbidden in Islam to call God the Father. So it became, uh, um, it was abrogated to call God the Father. Um, and it doesn't mean that it's, it doesn't mean that it's, I won't say, I don't, it's overstating to say it's absolutely forbidden, okay, because uh, there may be some cases where, I mean, it's not a sin, let me say. I don't believe it's a sin, but it is not the way that we are allowed to pray to God and we shouldn't conceive of God as the Father. Allah has many attributes. Rahmah, Lut, Jalal. Are any of them, do any of them indicate masculinity? <coughs> Fatherhood, masculinity, none of them do. The only thing that may be even to some extent makes us think of, of, of gender is in fact Rahmah. I mean, Rahmah is the, is the one that's most clearly related to a gendered concept, which is the Rahm, which is the, the uterus and the source of mercy. This is not to say that Allah is gendered, but to say that it's interesting that this, this attribute of Allah, um, Rahmah, which is repeated again and again and again, we know that Allah's Rahmah overtakes creation and that Prophet Muhammad Sallam talked about the mercy of God, God's mercy towards his people being like the mercy of a mother towards her children. SubhanAllah, the Prophet Muhammad Sallam kept referring to maternal feelings, whereas before Islam, the, the most a uh, common metaphor was the paternal relation, feeling for, uh, of God. That was the metaphor that was used. So this is, a, this is um, something that we really need to think about significantly because pre-modern people, um, at least as long as they were in um, urbanized and in civilization, the time of written, so the historical period, that... Um, the uh, most societies were patriarchal in the sense that men had more of a role or were considered to be the appropriate, uh, um, uh, the, the proper gender to have control and power and authority over the community, the public role, right? Public authority. There's a lot of different, you know, questions about why that was. Is it ideological or is it just the reality of life? When you have most, uh, when you have life being nasty, mean, and short, um, you know, many women, their life expectancy less than 40 years old. Uh, uh, it being, taking a lot of labor to just, to just keep your family fed and happy and healthy. 
there's a lot of focus on that, you know, that area of life. So this is a complex area. I don't want to get too much into it. Um, we could talk about that later if you have questions. But for whatever reason, most societies were structured in a patriarchal manner. And pre-Islamic Arabia certainly was, certainly was. I mean, more than anything in particular, because without an overriding rule of law that, um, that kept order, and that enforce rights for people or rule of law, the only protection was through the tribe. The only way you had any safety and protection was through the, the protection of your tribe, your collectivity. This is why if you were an independent person, you could be kidnapped, you could be enslaved. Um, why, if you wanted to be protected in pre-Islamic Arabia, you either had to have a relationship of walaya which means a client relationship. You had to become a client of a tribe, and they said, okay, well, you're like an honorary member, kind of, or adopted member of our tribe. We'll take care of you. That's what walaya is. You had to do that, or you had to have an explicit contract for a limited period of time, saying as long as this person is in Mecca, they will be protected until, um, uh, until the Hilf um, al-Fudul, uh, for Mecca at least. So um, this was a very patriarchal society. We really need to understand how difficult it was to be a woman in the society where the person who was elevated was the strong warrior. I mean, look at pre-Islamic poetry. It is all about the martial virtues. It's, it's celebrating the warrior, right? And even women's poetry, women's special poetry, was a kind of cheerleading for the warriors. <laughs> that, that's a lot of, of what it was. They were the, that's sort of their role in that society. Of course, there are always some women who are exceptional, but basically that's what it was. So when we look at any changes that Islam brought to the situation of women, we have to understand their significance. Um, and what we should understand is that their significance is not simply for rulings for themselves. We always hear that, uh, oh, Islam improved the situation of women in the seventh century. The situation of women in the seventh century was very bad. Look, they got inheritance. They, got, um, uh, they had to have consent to marriage. They had the right to life, whereas before they could be subject to infanticide. Um, they, uh, there was a ban on this uh, vihar, which is, um, which is what we have here. So there are these different um, particular changes in the law. But, the, but what I want us to notice is that um, the Quran is not only, the message of the Quran is not only what the Quran gives as rules and regulations in, in a few particular areas, its message is also its sound, right? The sound is part of the message, the beauty of the, but also how the Quran responded to the people of the time. You could almost say, you could use an expression almost like the sunnah of the Quran. You know, we talk about sunnah Allahi, the Allah's like way of dealing with people on earth we can also look at, as it were, the way of the Quran of interacting with the people of that time. And what I want us to notice is the primary sunnah of the Quran, one of the dominant sunnahs of the Quran, is responsiveness to people who are oppressed and especially to women. The number of times that there is a revelation in response to a difficult situation that women find themselves in is remarkable. And so we have to say, this responsiveness is part of what the Quran's teaching us. So we have the story of, of um, Khawla, <coughs> Al-Mujadila. Of course, we have, a, we have a surah of the Quran that later is named after her. The woman who disputed with the Prophet Muhammad and made her complaint to God. SubhanAllah, what's amazing is, again, here's this woman saying, this, what's happened, this situation, the status quo is, is unjust. She really believed that. She had, she had a deep sense of conscience. How many of you know the background of this, what it means, what vihar is and what happened to her? Raise your hand if you know that. Not a lot do, okay. 
So I'm going to explain it because it's really important. There was, in pre-Islamic Arabia, there were many customs, and there was what you could call sort of laws or rules, but they weren't necessarily written down. But there were things that everyone knew that you did, and a lot of them had to do with um, superstitions or their pre-Islamic re religion. One of them was this, that if a man wanted to dishonor his wife, disrespect his wife, or he no longer wanted to really have a relationship with her, um, but he didn't want to deal with the consequences of divorce, right, for some reason, that he might say this, anti ilayya kevahri ummi. You are to me like the backside of my mother. What does that mean? Well, of course, you can't have an intimate relationship with your mother, correct? So by saying this, now he had, he had to treat her as if, not with the respect of the mother, but with the distance of the mother. That she is that repulsed. And it's a very vulgar statement. I mean, to hear it, you know, if we wanted to translate it in the vernacular, it would be very, you know, vulgar. So um, to say this is humiliating in and of itself. And it is also very consequential because the woman is, now she, she's not married, right? So she's, or she's not divorced. On the one hand, she's not free to go marry someone else but she's not really married. She's just stuck, she's tied to him, but she has no affection, love, intimacy with this man. So this was called vihar, this was the, the, the technical term. And it was a kind of taboo status. What I mean by taboo is that when you said this, you couldn't take it back. It was like uh, in the pre-Islamic era, if you adopted a child, that child really became part of your blood, right? From now, they are part of your blood. So it's a, it's a formula that transformed the relationship. So after her husband said this, he was, he was sorry that he did. They were old. Sometimes they fought. You know, this sometimes old people do. They get it, uh, grumpy with, them, with each other. So he wanted to go back to her, and she wanted to go back to him. But there was no way. If you said this, that's it. It is the ties cut. So she, Hawla, may Allah be pleased with her, went to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, said, you know, I, I want to go back to him. Can you do something about it? And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I can't do anything because I haven't received a revelation, which is proof that al-urf um, muhakkama, uh, or al-adat muhakkama, that custom is a source of law uh, without revelation. So he's acting on the existing customary law. So she's fighting with him, Jidal. The Prophet Muhammad said, when she's arguing with him, did he say, shut up, be quiet, how can you argue with me? I am a prophet, I'm the leader. I'm no, astaghfirullah. He never said anything of this. He, he said, I'm sorry, I haven't received a revelation. And she said, okay, then I'm going to complain to God. God will answer my prayer. SubhanAllah, it's so much like Hajar. And it's so much like Aisha radiallahu anha when she was accused of infidelity. Again and again, these women have a very strong sense of the justice of God. This is what you see in them. They really believe that. And, and they're willing to challenge even the highest authority, who they respect, but challenge and say, you know, I know that God will be on my side. So then this beautiful beautiful uh, beginning, opening of Surah Al-Mujadala was revealed. Qad sami allaha. God has heard qawla lati tujadiluka fi zawjiha. Who argues with you about her husband. Wa tashtaki illallah. And, and has made her complaint to God. Wallahu yasma'u. And Allah hears tujawadakuma your discussion or your debate in Allah has Samir Basir. Allah hears everything and sees everything. This is so beautiful. It's such an affirmation of her of her right to stand up and, and argue for her rights, you know, to articulate and argue for 
uh, what she believes is a wrong in society. It is a complete affirmation of that. And we have to think that this is the sunnah of the Qur'an. This is Allah's way of dealing with us we, as we see revealed in the Qur'an. So again and again, interventions. How, we can't even go through it. I mentioned Aisha radiallahu anha when she was unjustly accused of infidelity. We have this beautiful passage where um, the, uh, it was the wife of Jafar ibn Abi Talib coming back from Abyssinia saying to the women, oh, what happened while I was away? Does the Quran have anything like just about women? And they said, uh, well, not, not specifically on women. So she said, oh, I'm disappointed. I'm going to go and ask the Prophet Muhammad So she asked him, and because, you see, they thought that when, when the Quran used the masculine plural, that it was, they were used to men only being the ones who were important in society. That's why when, when uh, Aisha one time, she heard the Prophet Muhammad Sassam, he, from preaching from the masjid, she went, she went to go closer to the door to hear what he was saying. And the woman who was helping her do her hair said, oh, he's, he's um, speaking to the people, like a nas, not, not to you. And she said, am I not one of the people? Am I not one of the people? So. This, um, this idea, it was common for them to think, oh no, anything that's addressed, even the Quran revelation, it must be for men, unless it's specifically for women. So in response to that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this beautiful, beautiful passage of the Quran that affirms, no, everything is equal for you and for them. I mean, look how many words are revealed just in response to that. So when women ask the question, wait a minute, where are we in the community? Where are we with respect to this religion? Again, when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was asked this question, he didn't, he didn't say, how dare you ask this? And when, when it was, and Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, his responsiveness to the need, the needs and the desires of the, of the women was not, women should just know their place and their husbands will take care of it or the, no, it was this beautiful affirmation. Indeed, the Muslim men and the Muslim women and the believing men, the believing women, et cetera, to the rest of the, of the ayah. So beautiful, subhanAllah. Um, so we, we see that this, uh, this responsiveness is, is very strong and, and as I say, one of the dominant messages of the Qur'an, some, very often we talk about themes of the Qur'an, but this is a bit different than a theme. A, as I mentioned, I, I consider it of a kind of like a sunnah of the Qur'an, a methodology of the Qur'an. Um, and we should think about that when it comes to power relations, questions, questioning, um, and, and saying, wait a minute, is this from you? Or is this from God? Now the question is, if, if the Quran was so responsiveness, you know, there's this momentum building up, right? There's all of these things happening during the period of revelation, affirming women's <coughs> rights and increasing women's rights and affirming women's dignity and voice. So you have a kind of momentum. What happens after? Well, what happens is much of it continues and there's a lot of beauty in Islamic civilization and we see that, that women's lives are improved in many ways, but there's also a backlash. Like every, pro, every time there's progress in society in any movement, there will always be a, a backlash against it, right? Where the status quo tries to come back and reasserts its power. And sometimes they're successful and sometimes they're not. All we have to do is look at something like the so-called Arab Spring to understand some of this dynamic about backlash, right? When people are arguing, fighting for their rights and then the backlash of the entrenched elite. Uh, such an interesting statement that Khalid Abu Faldo, who's professor of um, Islamic law at UCLA, uh, mentions in his book, 
he mentions this very interesting statement by uh, Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab. May Allah be pleased with both of them. So Abdullah, who is the son of the Caliph Umar ibn al-Khattab. And Abdullah ibn Umar is a great scholar. He's a great Muslim. He is someone who we learn much of our religion from. He said something very, very interesting, subhanAllah. He said, while the Quran was being revealed, we were so careful with our women out of fear that maybe a verse would be revealed about us, right? Because like all this stuff is being revealed about women and how embarrassing would it be for your name <laughs> to be in the Quran or you, everyone knows all oh, that's about, about him because he was such a jerk to his wife or something like that. So we were so careful. But after, after the Prophet Muhammad died, then we did as we wished. And he's not bragging about it. He's not saying this is a good thing. This is kind of a confession. He's saying, he's saying, you know, we should have been as aware that Allah is watching us even when the Quran's not being revealed, but without that added disincentive, without that added threat of worldly hum humiliation and embarrassment, we, you know, we went backwards a little bit. And he doesn't mean himself necessarily because uh, Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, he argued, he was someone who argued sometimes with other men. Like for example, when a man said, I would never let uh, my, my wife go to the mosque. And uh, ibn Umar said, um, didn't you know that the Prophet Muhammad said, لَتَمْنَعُوا إِمَا Allah مَسَاجِدَ Allah." And the man, which means, do not forbid the maidservants of Allah from going to the mosque of Allah. And the man said, well, I wouldn't allow it. And Ibn Umar, he, he like punched him or poked him. And he said, he said, Qud qala Rasulullah. I, I said, the messenger of Allah said, and you say, I say? Meaning, you're putting your word above the messenger of Allah. So Ibn Umar was trying, but he saw like, you know, this when people have power, it's very difficult for them to give up. They don't give it up freely unless someone forces them or they really are, have very strong conviction and strong faith that it's the right thing to do. If you have power to give it up, it takes a lot of faith, a lot of conviction, a lot of willpower to give it up. So he says there was a, there was a rollback and we should understand that and you see it in different places. That in some places, the way people talk about women, even some scholars, some of the interpretations, it clearly is against this spirit. It clearly is against sometimes very explicit teachings. And um, this is why it's important that women and men work together and in dialogue, and this is part of the partnership, to really discuss these things because it's as bad for men to oppress women as it is for women. Right? The Prophet Muhammad said, Unsur akhaq, help your brother, madruman, whether he's the oppressor or being oppressed. So if there are men in our community who are doing something contrary to the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad Sassam, to, to the Quran who are engaging in dhulm, we need to help not just those women, but those men too. It is not helping them. It is not merciful or good for them to allow them to continue in sin and oppression. So we have to work together for everyone to help help this. But why do why did some patriarchy become re-entrenched in some cases? I, I mean, I have some theories about it. One, I would say, and I'm not I'm not someone who engages in like sectarian um, debate or anything like that. But I would say that that you know I do follow the Sunni tradition. Pro the 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 the, the Real, the, the, the one point that I disagree with Shiites about is the doctrine of the imami. I mean, that is the, the, the one thing where you have to take a position on. Either you have to accept it or you don't accept it. Because I don't accept it, that's what makes me a Sunni. Um, it doesn't, but after that, I don't think there's like everything we differ on. No, we should, we're all Muslims, we're all Ahlul Qibla, we should be together. And it's also up for Shiite Muslims to talk about, from their perspective, what these things mean for gender. But I do think that when we have the ending of the period of the patriarchal prophets, and then there's a reestablishment, 
of, of religious authority through descent through the sons, right, which is a, a patriarchal line of religious authority, I think it undermines one of the main messages of the Quran when it comes to this issue of, of human authority and gender relations. This is my speculation, and it may be completely wrong. Some Shiites might say, oh, but the line goes through um, Fatima, may Allah be pleased with her, and so this gives you know, um, a matriarchal establishment for it. So are those who could argue that? As I say, I don't want it to be a sectarian thing, but I, I, I find it a little bit problematic. There's also certain aspects of Neoplatonism, and this is getting a little bit um, esoteric, but for those of you who have studied Islamic philosophy and theology, part of Neoplatonic philosophy that entered in uh, Islamic discourse and some, not all Sufism, but some kinds of world-denying Sufism that, that really picked up a lot of, that was more almost philosophical Sufism than Sufism as spiritual discipline and practice. Those aspects that pick up Neoplatonism, whether they were philosophers or religious people, there is a very sharp divide between male and female. And the feminine is associated with matter, which is, which is evil and of this world, and the masculine is associated with uh, spirit, which is what we aim for. And this is one of the reasons why some of the, the Christian traditions that encourage chastity, it was because you could never attain the highest levels of spirituality if you were entangled with women, right? And, and with sexuality, which was of this world. Islam was against this view, but there was, if you look at some of the Neoplatonic both philosophy and some of the Neoplatonic spiritual writings, you'll see a very sharp divide between the feminine and the masculine form. And it really is a, a hierarchy. We have to be careful. And then there is just simply the tendency to rationalize existing patriarchal norms. So, you know, as, as people who were part of the Roman Empire, Byzantines and others, um, uh, Persians became Muslim and converted to Islam, Part of what they did is, uh, unfortunately, they had some of their existing customs and practices that sometimes they used Islam to support, some that were misogynistic or sexist. And we see it even today in the um, American prison system. And I have, I, I, I've taught chaplains and I've dealt with um, uh, chaplaincy in prison. It's very interesting because what you'll find is some of the men who are in prison for domestic violence, some of them even for murdering women, murdering their wife or girlfriend, and then they convert to Islam in prison. So this is what one of my students called, calls prison Islam, prison Islam. Um, it's so interesting because they like select certain aspects of Islamic discourse or teaching and construct a very misogynistic um, Islam that they will follow, that justifies their um, demeaning views of women. And now they're using religion to justify it when it was criminality that got them there in the first place. So it's interesting because all of us rationalize our needs and desires. Women are the same. But, you know, in this case, we're talking about this particular area. So we have to be very careful about that. Uh, this is just, I mentioned Khaled Abu Fadl who um, I think this is a really a very excellent book, um, very moving and challenging. Um, I don't agree with every aspect of it, and many, you know, um, I think there's lots of things that could be discussed, but he does really challenge people to look at this issue much more um, clearly. Fatima Mernisi, again, she says some really unsubstantiated and simply incorrect things about Islamic history and theology, certainly about Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab, who's my hero and I love, so I really resent what she says about him, and I believe it's not true because I think Sayyidina Umar actually overcome a, overcame a great deal of trauma, childhood trauma and a difficult life, and a lot of his own, pers what, what that created him in terms of a lot of anger, to really restrain it and, and be an extraordinary person. And in fact, he often upheld or upheld the situation like the rights of the weakest people in society, including women. 
I mean, there's some very moving stories about how Sayyidina Umar really struggled to help women who were in very difficult circumstances. But um, one of the things that Fatima Menonisi says is she talks about the archaeology of women. She says, where are the women growing up as a Muslim in Morocco? She didn't hear much about women in Islam. All she heard is the place of women in Islam is at home. Why are, you, why are you going out and studying? Why are you doing this? You should be at home. Meanwhile, she's in a country with the oldest continuing existing, continuously operating university in the world founded by a woman, founded by a great, pious, wonderful woman. So if we have something like Fatima Fihri, who founded this extraordinary institution, pious, who managed this, this enormous project, then, you know, why, why are we so blind to what's right in front of us? This is right, you know, in her society, yet everyone knows that the place of woman is just to be a, be a wife and mother and leave the public things. There's nothing more public <laughs> than this extraordinary mosque complex and the story of how this was built and what she did is, you know, you really should look it up. But it's not only that, it is that, and, and of course, this is the inside of Qarawin. And what's interesting is that even when Sheikh Hamza was teaching there about 15 years ago, you see that um, the way it's structured, it's very difficult. We have all the male students in this picture. You don't see the female students. But of course, when Sheikh Hamza uh, set up Zaytuna and is teaching his students, you see here they are side by side. So take the good, take the beautiful part of our tradition, and also, you know, uh, notice where there are barriers. And this is something that, mashallah, Sheikh Hamza and the other scholars at Zaytuna do. So this is, and of course you have it here at, at your uh, uh, institution as well. You know, where are the women scholars of Hadith? Many people were shocked by this book by Muhammad Akram Nadawi, in which he talked about finding not dozens, not hundreds, but thousands of female scholars in the, um, in the ijazas and in the manuscripts that he was working on. Women scholars of hadith and his results are summarized in this book, including things like evidence that women, women taught from the, the, the kursi, from the endowed chairs in mosques in Baghdad and, and Damascus. I mean, publicly to men and women in a public space. So this is, was shocking to many people. But what's interesting is that, again, we're very selective. Sometimes we don't even notice what's going on. For example, and I believe that some, there are some uh, women in this, in this uh, maybe place even today who have studied in Syria. Um, you, have, you have a group like the Qubaysiyat in Syria, whether you like their politics or not, this isn't about their politics, but we're talking about hundreds of women who are certified in the 10 qira'at of the Qur'an, who have ijazas in memorizing the six books of hadith with all of their asanid. Hundre hundreds of them, mashallah. May Allah preserve them, preserve the people of Syria, bring peace and healing to them. Ya Rab. But, the, you know, subhanAllah, we have all of these women, and then you hear... You know, you hear, oh, no, women aren't, you know, involved. It's like, it's right in front of our eyes. It's there everywhere, but there's a kind of blind blindness to it. Um, now, how do we, how do we um, rectify it? The other thing I want to say, very important point, there is more and more and more historical evidence that um, in pre-modern, pre-colonial Muslim society, the strength of pre-colonial Muslim society was in the awqaf. The awqaf are the endowments that support different charities, right? Schools, madrasas, universities, soup kitchens, um, orphanages, um, shelters for, for women, homeless shelters, um, animal, um, like uh, uh, humane societies, all of those things were in Islamic society. They're supported by charitable endowments. They're called al-qaf, or in the Maliki tradition, habus, okay? Habs habus, waqf al-qaf. Study after study sh so shows that at the rise of, at the beginning of colonialism, approximately, in most places, approximately 50% of the al-qaf were founded by women. <coughs> 
and approximately 50% of the alqaf were administered by women. What does it mean to be the, administer, the administrator of a waqf? It means that you are responsible for ensuring that w if this waqf is based on, say, the profits of a farm or rental property or whatever, any income generating um, uh, business, right? You take the income and then you apply it to the charity. So when you are the overseer of the waqf, you get both a salary and you have status. You have, to, you have to talk to the farmers, you have to talk to the person who's maybe managing or supervising the farm, you have to count the money, you have to make sure people are doing, it's like being the executive director of a charity now. You have to decide the projects, all of these things. So this is, has been part of Islamic society. Women were everywhere. When people talk now, Muslims talk now about traditional Muslim society, very often it's based on ignorance because we don't know what traditional Muslim society is without going back and doing the historical research. Traditional Muslim societies were destroyed. The only places that um, they were not destroyed but somehow continued in some ways were some of the tribal areas, but the tribal areas were always exceptions in Islamic civilization. Tribal people have always been a little bit different and um, kind of difficult to, to, to work with, frankly. So they tend to be the most patriarchal and the most difficult to, to get them to work together collectively for the good. They're, they're, they have their tribal interests. So you see that we don't have to mention the countries, but some countries, you know, are characterized very strongly by tribalism. So we see that. But in the vast majority of Muslim lands, we had women who were working with men in all of these different projects successfully. Religious women, you know, women in hijab, some women, you know, women with different kinds of veiling, whatever it is, pious women, but they were busy in it. It was destroyed by colonialism because the colonialists wanted the land, they wanted the property. Um, and then after independence in the post-colonial period, when in the area, uh, era of nation states, the new dictators who arose in the Muslim world, they they replicated the model, the authoritarian model that they had inherited. So rather than return to the pre-colonial model, which is where there was this large civic society or voluntary sector, uh, the government had very minimal involvement in people's lives in pre-modern Muslim society. They adopted the methods of the modern nation state which exercised great control and power over people's lives very top-down, hierarchical, central planning. So what did they do? They all established a Ministry of Endowments and Religious Affairs. Wazarat al-Aqaf wa shu'un al-Islamiyya, right? So almost every Muslim country has this kind of ministry. All the projects were, all the mosques were taken over by the government, and the people who worked in there were not appointed by the local administrator, but by appointed government personnel. Well, when did this happen? Th this, all of these things happened when, when men, even in Europe, were the only public bureaucrats, right? The bureaucracy was dominated by men. So the, in the Muslim community, or Muslim, new Muslim nations, they reproduced that, and they appointed men to all these bureaucracies. You never had, so you didn't have any women anymore. And people grew up in that environment, and they had kids in that environment, and they thought this is the way things have always been done. Oh, this is traditional Islam. It's not traditional Islam. It is post-colonial Islam, which is not traditional Islam. And so different Muslim nations have tried to rectify that through this different ways. So for example, Turkey for a time, <coughs> a, Turkey has in the last number of years appointed women in the Mufti's office. So, for example, uh, Mufti Qadriya is one, she served for a number of years in the Mufti's office, and one of the things that she did is to take a survey of all of the mosques in Istanbul and see whether they were, like, they had good facilities for women. That was one of the projects that she did. So one way is to keep, you know, unfortunately, most of these governments are not interested in dismantling their own power. So they still are doing it through the ministries. So you have that, you have, um, you have in Morocco, of course, the um, Murshidat, who are, have now been added 
to the Ministry of Religious Affairs, and they can go to Qairawin to study, and then they're appointed as kind of state-appointed chaplains. Um, you have in Egypt, you have women preachers, wa'az, who um, are now s appointed by the ministry to go and preach to women. Unfortunately, again, you know, it's all this top-down through the bureaucracy serving, to a large extent, the interests of the government, rather than letting the interests of the people really um, you know, be free and, and, and flourish. But this is what we're dealing with now in terms of power structures. Um, and then you have people like uh, the, the uh, women imams of China, and I'm almost at the end. I always talk way longer than I say I'm going to, <laughs> but well, I'm almost at the end. We have the women imams of China who, uh, it's misunderstood by many people. These are not imams of mixed gender congregations. They are called female imams. Imam simply means leader. They're the female imams for the women of the community. They have even sometimes their own separate mosques. These women are paid. These are paid positions. And they teach. They do what we call pastoral care or spiritual care. Um, they go visit the people in the home and they arrange visits for the women who are sick at home. They make sure that, that the needs of the women of the community are taken care of. And what I really like that is they use a mosque not as a place where everyone just has to come to them. They do provide services in the women's mosque, but they go out from there in the community to do these home visitation, which I think is very important. Now, these were founded originally by a man, by a Chinese Muslim who saw four centuries ago that his, his country, that the Muslims of China were in danger because they had gone from many centuries where the Chinese government the Chinese emperor was very open, and the different Chinese dynasties were very open to Muslims and welcoming, to a more xenophobic chi dynasty, Chinese dynasty, that said, oh, we don't want all these foreigners. We, it sounds so familiar. We don't want foreigners in China. So if you're going to stay here, Muslims, you Muslims, we, you can't import imams anymore and scholars and you need to marry into the, the Chinese women here so you become more Chinese, culturally like us, so culturally you fit in. So they said, well, we have to do something because they felt that without the influx of this knowledge and learning and scholars from, from the central Muslim lands that this would be lost. And until then, they had taken, even though they were Muslim, they tended to follow Confucius, Confucian culture which is extremely patriarchal. So traditional Confucian um, culture does um, make women very submissive to men and it's not necessary that women learn like men learn. So now the, the Muslim leaders said, wait a minute, we are not gonna survive if the women in our community don't understand their religion in this situation. And so they founded schools for educating both men and women in their community. They established, once they were trained, there were women who were appointed as female imams as they had male imams. They, they taught, they mentored, they established these female mosques. And this is something that allowed Islam to flourish in China for centuries. During the time of the Cultural Revolution, when Mao, when, when all religion was prohibited in China in the 20th century, um, everyone had to go into hiding, whether you're Christian, Buddhist, um, whatever your religion was. When it was allowed then about three decades ago for religion to be um, practiced in China now, then the Muslims re-established their um, institutions. And what's interesting is because they were they didn't have a lot of money, obviously, and also they felt a little bit insecure about their religious knowledge because it had been subsumed for a long time, so not everyone felt really secure. Guess what happened? I'll let you think about it for a minute. So what happened is certain Muslims from other countries, I'm not going to name them, um, who had a lot of money, came into the country and said, oh, 
we'll build mosques and we'll send imams who can teach you about Islam, right? And what were they taught? They were taught, uh, uh, first of all, the mosque that they built looked like they belonged in, say, a hot desert, rather than the mosques that traditionally were in China, which were beautiful, gold and red, and that the architecture, it was a mosque, but it was also so beautiful, so Chinese. You know, it was really chi a Chinese mosque. Um, so they built, they, they didn't build any of those kind of mosques. They want, they were all these whitewashed sort of, you know, and the architecture just didn't make sense in the climate or anything. But plus, they said, oh, this, this uh, idea, women imams, what that, this is some kind of bid'ah, oh, what do you, you know, what is that? So then the Chinese Muslims themselves had to start to get some, some confidence in actually what they understood about their religion and what they did and really examine what do we need for our society and what are the benefits of what w our ancestors had developed and reestablish this tradition. Um, but it's still a struggle there. You see this other ideology that's really pushing against it. So it's very interesting um, to see that. Um, I'm going to keep going just because uh, I know we have to end, but this is the, this is the surah of the Qur'an that we're talking about, which is so beautiful. And I want us to pay attention to it and really think about it where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the believing men and the believing women are awliya, okay? Ba'dhum awliya ba'd. Wilaya. Remember I talked about wilaya and the tribes, that if you didn't belong to a tribe, you had to make this, this is where the word maula comes from, you had to become attached to a tribe. So wilaya is a relationship. Sometimes it's translated as friendship. Sometimes it's translated as partners. It really is allies. It means it's the person who has your back. You have their back and, and they have your back. You are protecting each other. You're taking care of each other. You're the one to call if there's a problem. That's what it, it's a very strong word. And I want you to notice something. I think this is so important. So the believing men and the believing women are allies of one another. They enjoin the right. They forbid the wrong. They establish prayer. This is a partnership. This is a partnership. The believing men, the believing women. They give zakat. They obey Allah and his messenger. We have all of this. This is what we do. These are the community functions, right? Establishing mosques and prayer and zakat, giving charity, all of these things. Doing good in society, staying away from evil. But what does Allah say at the end of this? They are the ones to whom Allah will show mercy. Ula'ika siyarhamuhum Allah. These are the people, wow, just think of it. Does our community need mercy? What do you think? You think we're in a state where we need the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If we want the mercy of Allah, these are the people who are going to get the mercy of Allah. The believing men and the believing women who are partners of one another, who work together to do these things. And you know what? This is a theological imperative, very clearly to me, because when we talk about Allah's mercy, this is really about faith, about what we believe about where mercy comes from and where success comes from. Where does success come from except from Allah? But look at it from a pragmatic point of view as well. What does Allah say before in this verse? The hypocritical men and the hypocritical women, they are part of one another. They enjoin what is evil and they forbid what is good, and their hands are clasped together, doing their evil work, right? So when we look at the people who are attacking us, and not everyone's attacking us, there are many, you know, we have many allies in the Christian community, the Jewish community, other people who are, are allies and are good with us, but when you look at the people who are working very, very, very hard, to put Muslims down, to attack Islam, they are working very well in partnership. And these are two people who are among them, who, who met at a party and uh, 
then hooked up later and got married even though he was uh, married at the time. But anyways, divorced his wife and married her. And they worked together in this. But I don't want to leave you with that bad image. I want to leave you with a good image. <laughs> and this is my last image. This is at a beautiful place in Toronto called the Sayyidina Khadija Center. Imam Slimi, who's from Morocco, a traditionally trained scholar, deliberately named it. He said, we don't have enough institutions named after women. So they named their, their Islamic center the Sayyidina Khadija Center. It is beautiful. They have a beautiful open musalla um, where uh, anyone can see the imam and pray. You really have a sense. And he asked me uh, about two months ago to come and speak at the masjid on this talk about, about Canadian Muslims and extremism. And this table is set up right in front of the mihrab. And sitting here we are, partners, um, awliya with one another, uh, Imam Salimi and Sheikh, some of you recognize Sheikh Faraz Rabani, uh, a beautiful, beautiful scholar and teacher, working together to try to do something good. Um, and this is, I have to say that as someone, I feel very, very blessed to have so many brothers in Islam who are my partners. Beginning with my husband, uh, my teachers, my peers, uh, scholars and imams who I work with, and my students. So it is, it, it's happening. Um, it is uh, um, a beautiful uh, thing that happens in our time, so we shouldn't exaggerate the negative and overlook what's positive, um, but just continue to understand the roots of it so that, so that when we see problems, we have some knowledge in order to counter the bad things that are happening. So with that, I'm, I'll end. I know I make too many promises about my timing. Thank you, Salaamu Alaikum, and we'll see if they say there's any time.